Hi, Don Forsyth back with you. Our topic is identity and inclusion. This is the second portion of that particular chapter's analysis. We already went through uh, the basic question of the need to belong and how strong is it and how people respond so negatively when they're excluded from their groups. And I'm afraid I went on for just too long talking about that. So I'll try to move more briskly through the final two topics examined within that chapter. And those topics are individualism and collectivism and social identity theory. So moving on. We're going to look at individuals and collectivism at, at three levels. We're going to want to think of it as a personality characteristic. That would be the micro level. We want to think about it as well as a group level characteristic. Some groups lean to more towards collectivism. Others uh, encourage more individualism within their members. And lastly, we'll turn to the cultural level, looking at variations in individualism and collectivism across cultures. Individualism then, is, uh, as is collectivism, it's an ideological outlook, it's a personality trait, it's an aspect of groups, it's many different things, but as the name suggests, an individualistic orientation stresses the rights of the individual. Uh, the person is primary. Uh, the very word individual means separate and apart from others. Collectivism reverses that emphasis. Uh, the group becomes primary. Uh, the group has the right to require individual members do certain things for, for others. The concept itself can be traced back to various sources. Individualism in particular is generally traced back to de Tocqueville and his analysis of the democracy in America, where he described individualism as, quote, a mature and calm feeling which disposes each member of the community to sever himself from the mass of his fellows and to draw apart with his family and friends so that after he has thus formed a little circle of his own, he willingly leaves society at large to itself." Unquote. So you can even see Tocqueville's classic analysis of individualism has elements of collectivism in it as well. Uh, the person isn't separate and apart from all people, just from larger social aggregates, uh, and remains in, in fact closely connected to primary groups, to, to families and friendship. But we'll try to trace this, this complicated concept at three different levels, societal, group, and individual level. Starting with the individual level, um, uh, certainly people vary a good deal as looking at individualism and collectivism as a personality characteristic. Individualists tend to agree with the statements here. On the left side, they're more independent, they seek personal goals, they're a bit more competitive, they emphasize their personal uniquenesses, they can get along fine without people and seek privacy. In part, uh, they believe they know themselves well and their communication style is somewhat less cooperative. Collectivists, on the other hand, uh, tend to seek out others. They value their relationships a bit more. Uh, they tend to be more dutiful in the sense that uh, they, they do what the group requires of them. Uh, their sense of who they are depends upon the context in which they find themselves. And they also have respect for individuals uh, in hierarchical settings, uh, authority figures in particular. Research suggests, of, of course, that, that there's some differences not just at the personality level, that the, perhaps the sexes differ slightly in their orientation with men being somewhat more individualistic, women being somewhat more collectivistic. But these differences are nuanced and certainly uh, not so strong um, in their effect on men and women. In general, men are collectivistic in the sense that they do seek out membership, particularly in large, well-structured groups. Um, such as military organizations. For example, uh, women are collectivistic in the sense that they don't really prize membership in, in large formal collections as much as they prize close relationships, particularly one-to-one -one relationships with others. There are suggestions that there are generational differences, that uh, the greatest generation, for example, was highly collectivistic. Uh, baby boomers, uh, somewhat collectivistic, 
uh, but of course uh, very work oriented. The the newest generation, the millennials, is reputed to be more individualistic um, than previous generations, although the data are still unclear on that. Uh, Brewer's optimal distinctiveness theory sort of wraps up this uh, balance between individualism and collectivism at the, the personal level, suggesting that, well, everyone seeks assimilation within the group. They're collectivists in a, in a sense. They, they want to submerge in part within the group. But they also seek differentiation from the group as well, and what they seek is this optimal level of distinctiveness or assimilation, if, if you will. So they're always seeking inclusion. They're always seeking the desire to be assimilated as well in her particular theory. So this need for distinctiveness waxes and wanes. At the mezzo level, the group level, different groups uh, stress individual needs. Uh, other groups stress collectivistic needs. Uh, the case study in the in our chapter um, was Jennifer Lois's analysis of Peak Search and Rescue, uh, a, a group uh, which specialized in, in helping people who are lost in the wilderness in the western part of the United States. One of the interesting things about that group was that it tended to attract individualists at the personality level, but the group itself was quite collectivistic. Many of the people who first expressed interest in joining the group did so to satisfy personal needs. They wanted to improve their skills in terms of uh, outdoor settings. They want to be recognized by their community as heroes, as do-gooders, uh, but the Peak Search and Rescue uh, had strong norms which stressed the collective needs. Uh, the group always came before the individual and people who weren't able to cope with that particular set of norms didn't last long within the group. So groups that uh, stress and recognize in their mores uh, individualism uh, would recognize that each individual needs to be autonomous, each person is unique, general relations among members are exchange relationships, so there's a trade back and forth of positives and negatives between people. The distribution norms are one involving equity, so whatever an individual puts into the group, they hope to receive in turn from the group. Egocentrism is typical in such groups, meaning that the members of the group view themselves as the centers of the group, and, and that is allowed. Um, reciprocity, uh, which is closely related to exchange tendencies, is that there should be a give and a take within the group that if, for example, someone benefits you, you are expected to benefit that specific individual in return. If someone harms you, then you have the right to harm them back. Collectivistic groups, on the other hand, stress conformity. The tall nails should be pounded down. Uh, individuals are expected to do their duty. Uh, the emphasis is not on exchange between people, but communal relations. You should put into the group, contribute to the greater good, without being as concerned about what you will extract. People should be traded equally um, rather than a, a clear status hierarchy, although there's going to be strong status hierarchies in collectivistic groups. Um, that individuals shouldn't expect to get out more from the group if they put more into the group. Uh, they should be centered on the group rather than on themselves, and they should focus uh, on the group. Um, collectivistic groups tend to be very in-group focused and actually somewhat more likely to reject members of the out-group. Individualists, on the other hand, tend to have weaker boundaries between their groups, and so they're not quite so ethnocentric as collectivistic groups. Studies of cross-cultural variations find that uh, people vary across the world, cultures vary across the world, and how collectivistic they are. This particular diagram comes from a creative anthropological analysis where they had individuals in many different cultures play the ultimatum game, which is an interesting exchange game where you are told you have a certain amount of money or resources and you can split it with another person. You can give them as much or as little as you want to, but the one rule is that person must accept the offer you make, otherwise no one gets anything. And what you find is that in some cultures, uh, people give great a great deal in this particular little America culture, um, which is actually a whaling culture. As it turns out, um, these individuals give quite a bit to the other person, over 50%. Whereas in other cultures, it's usually close to 50%, but in some, it's actually a fairly small amount offered back. So 
if we use the ultimate game as an indicator of collectivism across the world, we can see great variations. Of course, much of this work comes from Hofstede's work, uh, which he looked at cultures around the world by studying the employees at uh, international, transnational company, uh, uh, IBM, as it turns out. And he did identify differences across cultures in terms of several dimensions, but that includes individualism and collectivism. The most prominent distinction being that uh, Western countries, that would be the British and the Americans in particular, highly individualistic, perhaps the most individualistic of all cultures. Um, West Eastern countries, um, that means, say, for example, China, Japan, Korea in part, although it's drifting towards strong individualism, uh, India, other Asian countries tend to be more collectivistic in their orientation. Of course, within any country, you're going to find subgroups as well that vary in terms of collectivism and individualism. Here in the United States, Asian Americans and Latinos tend to be more collectivistic um, than uh, traditional Anglos um, from Europe, uh, basically tend to be more individualistic. And you can also find it in cross regions in the country. Northerners tend to be somewhat more individualistic than Southerners, although Southerners, their culture is tinged in part by their culture of honor, which is diagrammed here. It is the idea that uh, Southerners expect people to respect their cultural sensitivities and an uh, individual from the South, if his honor is challenged, will be more likely to respond negatively than an individual from the North. Uh, it is suggested by researchers, particularly Dick Nisbet, uh, that this is due to their cultural heritage, that in the South, the culture of honor requires that you respect others. And if your respect is questioned, you as an individual are expected to take matters in hand and, uh, if necessary, use aggression to maintain uh, the proper image of honor within the context. That about wraps up our analysis of individualism and collectivism. Our final topic, which we'll examine in the next presentation, is social identity theory. Thank you, as always, for joining me.